Welcome to vlog 10. What is your teaching philosophy? Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to our next vlog. And yes, this one, once more, is by request. And by request from the lovely Laurie. Laurie has submitted her PhD. Woo, yeah, come on. She submitted her PhD. It's currently under examination and she's applying for work at the moment. So she wants as many skills that we can give her to enable her career to the next step. And I know that's the case for a lot of you guys and gals out there. But even for the guys and gals who have just started your PhD, remember I always say to you, start with the end in mind. I always want you to visualize what the conclusion of your candidature looks like. So today might also be of use to you. Now I know some of you are already working in higher education, that's fantastic. Some of you want to work in higher education. But I'm also aware a very large chunk of our crew is working or wishes to work in the private or the public sector more generally. Again, the skills we're talking about today are useful and it's part of what I call the professional development suite that I'm introducing to you in these vlogs. Now, in an earlier vlog, I did mention the phrase teaching philosophy and Laurie almost immediately sent me an email and said, Tara, right, what is a teaching philosophy? And more importantly, how do I create one? So it is my pleasure to provide that skill base for the wonderful Laurie today. But for the guys and gals who also end up outside of universities, today is also incredibly useful. And again, I'm telling you one of those truths that perhaps not a lot of people tell you. Let me tell you why this is useful. Guys, training is big very, very big at the moment. And a lot of you will end up working in small and medium-sized enterprises or indeed being consultants for small to medium-sized enterprises. So you're going to need a sense of who you are as a consultant, as a trainer, as a learner, and as a teacher. There's a very important income stream to be gained from this type of consultancy work, guys. And in my career, particularly when I was in Europe, public speaking, consultancy and training, mm, they were nice little earners for me. So when I published a book when I was living and working in Europe called The University of Google, my speaking fee went up to $3,000 euros or pounds an hour. So never underestimate the importance of this type of skill base and how you can commodifies your, commodify your knowledge for new audiences. So we're going to be talking about through a lot of the rest of this year how to brand yourself to enable those types of opportunities. But this session today is focused on asking you to think about yourself as a learner, as a teacher, as a trainer, and how you convey that information to others. But first we have to do the shout outs, firstly to the wonderful Laurie who is a, a dear person in my life. I love getting her emails and every morning I'm waiting for that email to say that the thesis has been passed. So Laurie, the whole office is with you, darling one. To the wonderful Tova who I spent a lovely hour with last week, fantastic human being, so inspirational, so aspirational. Tova, you're a star. The wonderful Susan, you're a fantastic human being. We're nearly getting there, mate, I promise you. So Susan, you can do it. And oh yes, I had one of those Friday afternoons last Friday afternoon where, where another fascinating gentleman arrived in my office. So Michael, you are amazing. I loved every single minute that I spent with you. And could you please pass my respects to Barbara and tell Barbara we're going to sort you out. We're really going to sort you out. Respect to Barbara. And also to all the guys and gals in the Alice. I really think of you every day and I'm going to get to the Alice as soon as I can. So big shout out to the Alice. Now, let's get into this. I get myself into a lot of trouble, guys, when I talk about 
teaching and learning in higher education. And I'll tell you why. I published and still publish a lot of articles in the Times Higher Education. And a big shout out to my mates at the Times Higher Education. And when I used to write my regular columns in particular, I used to quite staunchly argue that university academics should also hold teaching qualifications. So yes, you have a degree in biology, yes, you have a degree in history, but you are teaching. So you require some form of teaching qualification. Ooh, -er, I got in trouble. Was I terribly popular? Not really, but I do believe this because my argument is as follows. The PhD is great and it's important, but there is nothing in a PhD that gives you the information, the knowledge set you require for teaching and learning. You have a PhD, that's not a PhD in how you teach in higher education. You have no real sense through a PhD program about how to configure curriculum, how to configure learning outcomes, how to select educational technology, how to manage multimodality in what you do in teaching and learning. Also how to manage an on-campus and also an online subject and course and the differences between them both. So what's often argued in higher education guys is that experience is all you need. So you learn on the job. You learn to be a teacher in higher education by teaching in higher education and you have to decide if that's good enough for you and that's good enough for our students and that's good enough for our nation. Is learning on the job enough for the highest type of teaching we do in our sector in our universities. As most of you know, I hold three bachelor degrees, three master's degrees, a couple of graduate diplomas, long story, uh, and also a PhD. Now guys, I didn't intend in my life to have that suite of, of qualifications. It sort of accidentally happens. You know, I have my traditional bachelor degree in my traditional discipline with my traditional master's degree, that's great. But then I realized, mm, the future of knowledge is interdisciplinary. So I did my interdisciplinary bachelor degree and my interdisciplinary master's degree. And then I did an interdisciplinary PhD. But this is where the story becomes interesting and I want you to think about this. After my PhD, I then returned and did another couple of courses in higher education. Particularly what I did was a Bachelor of Education and a Masters of Education because I believe that teaching and learning in higher education requires expertise, knowledge, rather than simply experience through doing it. Now I get a lot of aggro emails about this and you might be going, Tara, you're absolutely wrong and that's tremendous. Send me an email, come and see me, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and we can talk about your perspective on teaching and learning in higher education. I want you to think about how you feel about teaching and learning in what we do. So a key question really is, what is this teaching philosophy and why do employers ask for it? Now we've talked about in a lot of our earlier vlogs I think that a lot of the income that is earned in our universities is via teaching. Teaching subsidizes research rather than the other way around. So guys and gals who employ you want to know that the people who are working in our institution know what we are doing and that we have a commitment, a belief, a passion in teaching and learning. So these institutions, yes, want you to have a PhD because that affirms and acknowledges that you have expertise in the discipline. So a PhD is incredibly important, but they need to see that you can teach. And one of the proxies to see if you can teach is a teaching philosophy. There's also, of course, a bigger reason beyond employability for you to think about a teaching philosophy, guys, because a good teacher is a reflective teacher. A good teacher thinks about what they're doing and every single day realises we are all learners and every morning we should learn something new. So today, to help Laurie and help the rest of you, I'm going to get very deeply into the teaching philosophy. In this short vlog, by the end of it, you will know what it is and you will know how to create it and I'll provide the scaffolding questions so that you can write one today. So let's get into the really easy question, what is a teaching philosophy? 
It is a document that is between one and two pages in length that addresses really three separate areas. Firstly, your conceptualization of teaching and learning. Secondly, a description of how you teach. And finally, a rationale for why you teach. So as you can see, the three questions, what, how, and why you teach. That's a teaching philosophy. So this short document can stand alone. So a lot of job applications ask for a teaching philosophy. You put it at the end of the application. But the teaching philosophy can also be, and frequently is, the first two pages of a much bigger document that's called a teaching portfolio that you develop through your career. So a teaching portfolio features all sorts of documents like your student evaluations, the curricula that you have designed, particular educational technologies, podcasts, vodcasts that you've created, you can do the link to them in your teaching portfolio. So a lot of applications these days, particularly in Aotearoa, New Zealand, yes Australia, but also Canada and particularly the United States, want a teaching philosophy with the application. So it's always a good idea guys to have a draft of a teaching philosophy just on your hard drive. It might simply from today's gig have a series of questions that you might address but it is a living document. You write one when you're doing a PhD and just starting your teaching career and I still have one to this day and I change it every couple of months. This is a living breathing document. This is about you and your perspective on the world. It is a narrative. It's a narrative where you define, you describe, you discuss who you are as a teacher and what is important to you. At its best, and this might be sort of the next iteration of it, at its best it provides the standards and the criteria by which you can figure what is a high quality teacher and then you assess yourself by that criteria. Now in North America this is a really big gig and the teaching philosophy has splintered into a whole series of different documents. So just park this and know you may be asked for this information if you're going to North America. So a philosophy of education, a philosophy of classroom management, a philosophy of educational technology and of course something I ask our new supervisors at Flinders to do, I ask for a supervisory philosophy. So so in current contemporary PhD speak, most of your supervisors, I would love to have a supervisory philosophy that they share with you as a two-page document. Okay, so when you are thinking about your teaching philosophy, you're going to think about your current abilities, what you do well, and the areas in which you believe you can improve. Now Stephen Brookfield who was an incredibly influential scholar particularly in my early 20s when I was working out who I was as a teacher, he defined a teaching philosophy as quote an organizing vision. Isn't that brilliant? A teaching philosophy is an organizing vision. What are you trying to achieve through your teaching and learning and how do you activate your personal and professional expertise in and through the classroom. So let's talk about how you do one now, how you do a teaching philosophy. Now internationally there is no template. The limitation is a length of page if you will, so it's never longer than one or two pages, keep it to that. It is also personal, it is written in the first person. Right, so what I'm going to do for you now is ask you some enabling questions that I'd like you to write down and your answer to those questions that you type might only be a paragraph and that will be your teaching philosophy. So once you've actually answered my questions, remove the questions, they're just the scaffold to get you to your teaching philosophy. Okay, so these are the scaffolding questions for you. Why is teaching important to you? How do people learn? How do you develop a student's potential? What is an outstanding teaching moment for you? Describe that for me. And how do you improve 
as a teacher? What are the aspirations for you as a teacher through your career? Now those questions pretty well will get you to some first version of a teaching philosophy. But also remember that the how bit of the philosophy is important. The people who are reading it haven't seen you teach, so you need to configure a word picture for them so they can see what sort of teacher you are. So show how you put your beliefs in practice through your teaching and learning. So we've asked the easy questions. I'm now going to put some provocations out there to get you to really crystallize who you are as a teacher, what matters to you and what doesn't. So let's go for this. So you tell me, are teachers or are students responsible for learning? Who is responsible, a teacher or a student? Is teaching a political act for you? Is it activism or should politics be kept out of the classroom? How do teachers improve what we do? How do we improve our practice? And finally, how do you manage students who struggle or excel? Have you got a theory of differentiated learning? So start to get really specific about what is important to you. Is it simply you're interested in being a master of a particular discipline or content set and passing that on to the next generation? Is that why you're in this business? Is it to enable citizenship, to enable teamwork and collaboration? Are you interested in employability or are you interested in critical thinking? However you may define that. So teaching philosophies, guys, do change through your career. They often do start, and this is true, focused on content. So you start really intensely engaging with curriculum, the content, the information knowledge base. But then through your career you start to move to assessment, understanding why people learn, quality and mode of feedback, interaction with students, interaction with colleagues. So from this basis, from this two-pager guys, all sorts of materials exist in your wider teaching portfolio. And I just wanted to say to you, start collecting material for this. It might be student evaluations, curricula documents, all the digital records that you have of your teaching and learning, and the really important one, the unsolicited student and colleague comments about your teaching. Keep every single email. They will help you get a job. So this document also has a whole series of uses beyond a job application, very useful for promotion as well, could I say, but from the teaching philosophy, a selection committee will ask you a series of questions from it, so you're giving them information. Make sure you're ready to answer these questions about, if I asked one of your former students, what would they say about your teaching? If I sat in the back of your classroom, what would be the first thing I would log or notice about your teaching? How do you build relationships with your students online? And do you start with the learning objectives and then map the readings and the technology over that? Or do you find the really edgy, innovative readings and then find a way to connect that to learning outcomes and learning objectives? So give me types of examples about what has worked in your teaching and learning and what hasn't worked and how you've improved that. So you're getting the sort of field that we're talking about now. The biggie also, and it's a big question and we all do in higher education need to have an answer to this, how do teachers in universities improve our practice? Big question for you, big question for the sector. The key is to make your teaching philosophy unique, personal, authentic, keep it real. Selection committees read hundreds of these. It should do a lot more than simply restate your CV. They're going to read your CV anyway. And do feel free to express the challenges of teaching and learning that you've experienced in your career. We love that stuff. Also show awareness of the trends in international higher education and be very comfortable being discipline specific. So biology education is very different from legal education. So 
education history is very, very different from environmental science. So be very comfortable with those differences. So when you've written that first draft, and really well done, here are the criteria by which you can assess it and continue to improve it in future. Have you presented a clear theme in and through your philosophy? Have you presented what's often called the organising principle of your teaching and learning? Have you grabbed an audience through your writing? Is it evocative? Is it powerful? Is it passionate? Would you like to be taught by the person who has written that document? Express enthusiasm, but also really make sure that it is authentic for you. Try if you can, if you're going to select some examples, make sure they're tethered overtly and cleanly to your organising principle. Brilliant. The wonderful Brian Coppola once stated that a teaching and learning philosophy should answer one question. One question. What is teaching and learning for you? What is teaching and learning for you? If you can answer that question in life, let alone in a teaching philosophy, you're doing incredibly well. So remember, this teaching philosophy will develop through your career. Be really comfortable with that. This is your first go to express who you are as a teacher and a learner to the world. So go for it. Be splendid. Be passionate. Make it count. Because you count and our students matter. Every single day, our students matter. So thank you to the wonderful Laurie for her fantastic suggestion. Keep them coming in, Laurie. You are terrific. Have a wonderful week, guys. And as always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.